Uh, for the record, today is the uh, 11th of October 2016. We are recording the oral history of Steve Kirsch for the Computer History Museum. And thank you very much for being here. My name is Günter Steinbach. I'm with the Semiconductor Special Interest Group of the museum. And uh, with us is uh, Mark Weber via telepresence and uh, you can say yourself who you are. And I'm the curatorial director of the Internet History Program. Okay, so uh, starting with just your background, where did you grow up? What's your family background? So I grew up in uh, uh, West Los Angeles hmm. and uh, had a, a fairly normal childhood, I guess. Uh, uh, I was a little bit uh, uh, interested in computers, I'd say, in an early age. So in sixth grade uh, in elementary school, uh, we had a, a computer called a Programma 101. And uh, so we were very fortunate in being able to get a, to have a school. It was a public school. And uh, we were able to get uh, one of these Programma 101s. Uh, and I was in sixth grade. And uh, I just was, was fascinated by it. So it was, it's the equivalent of uh, a programmable calculator today. Um, but back um, w in those days, um, uh, you know, this is 1960s, uh, mid 60s, uh, that was pretty hot stuff. I'll say, yes, in the 60s. Um, so, uh, what did you do for fun as a kid? Um, for fun, uh, I was pretty into to school work and uh, making sure I got good grades, so I'd be be studying a lot. But uh, yeah, I mean, for for fun, I'd be into computers uh, wow. in in that um, uh, in my my early days. So my, my spare time, uh, it was uh, first learning about computers and then taking more classes and learning more and. Um, I got uh, uh, I put together a computer club. A mm -hmm. bunch of individuals, and uh, and we had a, 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 a relationship with a local computer training organization, and we got access to an IBM 360 uh, mainframe, and so uh, I was programming that in uh, uh, in Fortran and uh, and also PL1 uh, at the time. So learned about uh, you know the, the famous IBM Principles of Operations uh, book at that point. Uh, learned how to program card sorters and um, accounting machines um, and so forth. So I would be, you know, I could wire up uh, programs to program things. I knew how to program a key punch to, with a, with a paper um, uh, drum. And so when I come to the Computer History Museum, of course, it's like, m you know, going back to my childhood because I actually worked on those machines, you know, when they were at their prime. Um, so, yeah, so he got a lot of experience at a very young age uh, uh, and a lot of exposure to computers uh, because of generous people, you know, people, uh, adults who would normally not let kids access mm -hmm. an IBM 360 mainframe, uh, I was able to, uh, uh, to access and, you know, in some cases I'd be like the, you know, nobody else would be in the room, I'd be in the computer room typing on the console of an IBM 360, that's pretty cool. Wow. <laughs> So you were your, um, go ahead. Um, were your parents in technical field interested? In no, no, not really. Um, my mom was kind of a, a stay-at-home mom, and uh, my father was a um, uh, a CPA, and and uh, they got divorced at a f when I was fairly young. Uh, so I was mostly living with my mom, and um, so she was taking care of the, care of the kids. But it was nothing you know, super extraordinary, like none of them were computer scientists or anything like that. Okay, um, so you, you studied at MIT, so how did you get there across the country? Yeah, so what happened was that um, I, uh, when I was in h high school, uh, I got connected with the uh, ARPA group at uh, UCLA. And so I, um, they were kind enough to, to give me an office, which I shared with John Postel uh, at UCLA. And so, so this is kind of cool because you're sharing an office with the, um, and, and sort of our, my sponsor was uh, John Postel. 
And so, you know, he, he's the guy who uh, created the RFC system and the um, uh, and email. And oh, so this this was this was pretty cool. And I, I was actually the one who um, programmed the email system that they used <laughs> to communicate. So I, I wrote the email system for the guy who invented email. <laughs> and so, so, so what year is when did you start that relationship? Um, so that was in the uh, early seventies. Um, so about you know nineteen seventy to nineteen seventy four. So just before going to MIT, and it was Vince Cerf who's, who I, I asked for, for advice, and I said, so where do you think I should go to school? And Vince said, uh, I think you should go to MIT. So, you know, it's pretty cool to have the father of the internet telling you where to go to school. I mean, it's <laughs> so not MIT your average situation. <laughs> so MIT at the time was, was already known for, for the computer science uh, yeah, they had a great computer science uh, program. They had this uh, machine called the Dynamod, and uh, they had this um, uh, operating system, um, uh, the, um, oh boy, um, the uh, ITS, uh, incompatible time sharing. Because uh, MIT had compatible time sharing, CTSS. Um, and uh, that was kind of the mainstream, and computer, uh, Computer types tend to be renegades, and so they, this group, um, this is Richard Greenblatt and so forth, um, I think they looked at that and they said, fine, if they have compatible time sharing, we'll be incompatible time sharing. So it's ITS. And the motto of ITS was uh, uh, security by obscurity. And so you would interact with the operating system using DDT, which is a dynamic debugging tool. And there'd be all these totally obscure commands, and you could do things like spy on, on someone else's screen. And it was just really, really cool. A bunch of really cool, smart people just, um, just having a really good time. And so this was on uh, deck uh, PDP-10s, mm -hmm. which were kind of you know, the, the rage back this then. This is in Tech Square? Yeah, this is in Tech Square. So this would be like uh, early 1974. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, Richard, Richard Stallman, uh, uh, Richard uh, Greenblatt, list, um, list Machines came later. Um, about uh, uh, List Machines came about six years later in, in around uh, the 1980s. And then kind of List Machines at MIT became kind of the rage. But back then, you were um, using uh, uh, CRTs uh, connected to a um, uh, uh, DEC System 10. And uh, if you were cool, you're running ITS on that, and you'd be typing all these obscure commands in to, uh, to do things. <laughs> <laughs> Some of which I, I may even remember, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like a skip. the other main people? Talk a little bit about that group. Um, boy, um, uh, yeah, that, uh, hard to remember uh, all the names there. Mike Dornbrook was involved. Um, but there was a guy, Al Veza, uh, who was running the lab there, and um, uh, um, there's a guy who's like been there forever, um, whose name I'm blanking on. Uh, uh, oh, Dave, like Dave, Dave Moon was there, um, uh, and a bunch of other people. I mean, I, all do, I'm sure all documented by history, you know. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Guilt by association. <laughs> uh, so, I my uh, my reason for contacting you was, uh, as I said, the optical mouse, and I just wonder how how did you even uh, oh, easy. hit upon a yeah, mouse? Yeah. Because because but it was easy because I was this this was 1980. There were list machines. They were using Jack Hawley's um, mechanical mouse and. You'd move the mouse and nothing would happen on the screen. And so you'd have a $100,000 computer in front of you that you're programming in Lisp with, with you know, the, the, um, the cool cherry keyboards that had the meta keys and so forth. And everything worked, but the mouse, you know, you'd roll it and nothing would happen on the screen. And that was such a frustrating experience and I thought, oh shit, there's got to be a better way th than this. The, you know, the, me the mechanical stuff just isn't working, it, it ought to be optical tracking. And so from that idea, I built up a, a prototype um, using uh, components at the time. It was actually, uh, I used uh, just discrete logic uh, chips uh, to do it. I didn't have, um, I 
didn't yet, you know, the, the first thing was just to do gates to see if I could uh, design the analog and digital circuitry uh, to track uh, a pattern. And I used initially a checkerboard pattern and a four by four detector, which wasn't the, the best approach. Um, and then uh, I, after that, I just thought, oh, it's better to take lines, because um, it was tracking in two dimensions, the easiest way to do that is if you have a set of lines in one direction, then you could use a quadrature detector, so you have four segments, and as you're going over the lines, um, you could detect the motion in that direction by taking these two and subtracting, essentially, these two. And that way, you'd eliminate the noise factor uh, and could get the signal from the noise very easily, and you could track um, it in one dimension. And then I used color, so I had different color LEDs and different colored um, lines on the paper. So the lines, one would absorb infrared, and the other, um, uh, uh, but it would, so there'd be two LEDs. There was an infrared LED and a red LED. And under the red LED, the blue lines would look uh, black, and the infrared lines would be transparent, and under the infrared light, the infrared lines would be black, and the, um, uh, the blue lines would be transparent. And so it allowed me to separate a two-dimensional tracking problem, which was fairly difficult, into two one-dimensional problems, which could be solved with discrete circuits, um, and just uh, you know, create a counter, and that counter then could be read by a computer. And so later on, then I actually had all of that you know, programmed in a, a little microprocessor. And um, you know, so I'd write an assembly language in, in the microprocessor, and it would uh, take the inputs and then output RS-232 uh, the other way. So I was running RS-232 not with a chip, but actually constructing the whole bits. Mm. You know, so we go ones and zeros, and I would be generating the whole RS-232 stream uh, just in software. And so that's, <clears throat> so I built that as kind of the, the, uh, the, the second version once I had the discrete version up. And then I showed it to Steve Jobs, and Steve Jobs said, like the idea, lose the pad. And so, <laughs> and it was a fairly quick meeting with him, but, but it was, what was remarkable is that he, you know, got the concept really quickly that, okay, optical is a better way to do that, and also that people didn't want to carry a pad around. And so, you know, you see, you saw firsthand, you know, there's, there's the legend of Steve Jobs and there's, you know, reality and reality is, hey, this is a smart guy who is, who could actually like zero in on what's wrong with something pretty quickly and also appreciate um, a good idea. And so subsequently in, in later years when I started Frame Technology to do uh, uh, FrameMaker, uh, when, and Steve went over to Next to start uh, Next Computer, that we were one of the first guys that uh, they talked to about writing applications for the next computer. So we ported FrameMaker to the next. Mm. So, you know, out of that relationship that we built with uh, uh, when I first showed them the optical mouse. So this was when I was in, uh, at MIT. Um, I was a, uh, uh, I think I was a grad student uh, at the time at, at MIT. This is about 1980 time frame. Um, so how did you meet? You came out here? Yeah, because I said, hey, I'm building a mouse, I bet Apple needs a mouse. <laughs> I, you know, this was, I think, around the time of the Lisa or something, and I think, you know, so he clearly, I, I knew he was building something that needed a mouse, hmm. and, uh, and so I went out to show him, hey, you know, I've got this idea, I'm this, you know, kid out of college uh, <laughs> with an idea for... But he went with a mechanical mouse. He went with a mechanical mouse um, initially, uh, because he said, you know, hey, lose the pad, right? The mechanical mouse didn't have a pad, so th they built a, you know, reasonably good mechanical mouse. Um, but of course, everybody's using optical mice now. Right. Right. And even then, I remember using, I th probably one of your mice with the uh, red and blue lines. Right. On sun, the sun, sun microsystem. Yeah. Yeah. And and the original uh, the original versions, you had to wind them up. You'd have to, you know, go in circles for thirty seconds, and that's so I could get. What the, the, you know, what's a black line and what's a, um, uh, you know, and what's reflective. And uh, when we went to the quadrature system, then we didn't have the, the, the noise problems, the signal to noise, right? Because we had to set up what, you know, what's the threshold? Mm -hmm. And the threshold depends on how your LED was placed and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And so it was easier to, you'd have to crank the mouse at the, on the first mice that we built for Sun. Uh -huh. And then that went away when we went to this newer system. Okay.
So yeah, I remember not liking the pad, but it wasn't terrible. Right, it wasn't terrible. Yeah, especially in the newer versions where you didn't have to wind up the mouse, yeah. so it would always work. And that, that's when we went from quite, we went from two, to four sensors, you know, a little, uh, a two by two, mm -hmm. to a four by four array where this would be for one color and this mm -hmm. array would be for the second uh, color. Uh, so, How much did you know about the Xerox car controller? Um, I knew that Richard Lyon had developed a, um, a one that was more sophisticated optical mouse, so you know, hats off to him because you know, that technique that he used. So he used a hexagonal pattern, so it was a black and white hexagonal pattern, and so he would look with a camera and basically say, hey, what was the shift between image one and image two? And uh, from that he could discern how far the mouse moved. And, uh, you know, especially if you're taking samples very, very quickly. And uh, so that was good. And, and his thing, you can run on blue jeans and it would actually work. So it was sort of the precursor to today's optical mice, which, uh, you know, can run on any service because they look at the microscopic, you know, imperfections in whatever surface that you're on, even, even glass. Like Logitech has a, has a great uh, mouse that runs even on glass. It's very impressive. Although he actually, he used a pad too. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, um, they that's right. Richard Xerox. Ri yeah, the Xerox uh, one used. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, a pad no, with it was a pattern. It was a hexagonal yeah. type uh, type of pattern, and and yeah, so it's a so a bit more sophisticated. So he could get by with a one because he had a more sophisticated sensor. He had he had more horsepower than I did. He was working at Park. He had a lot of resources. I'm a little student at MIT, you know, and uh, so. Yeah, well, I'm yeah. on my own with no funding. <laughs> okay, so that gets us to uh, you starting mouse systems. Yeah. Uh, was there venture capital already at that time? Um, yeah, but um, that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fresh out of school, and um, uh, so I had $40,000 in savings. I was living at Fair Oaks West and apartments. So I remember having an apartment and I have my oscilloscope and I had, my, I had a workbench in my apartment and uh, I had the EEPROM programmers and so forth. And so I was constructing the hardware and I, I ran into a guy, Winston Chen, who was uh, one of the uh, principals at Selectron. And he um, offered to manufacture the, the mouse for us and he would do that uh, and he would extend credit so that we didn't have to pay him until like 30 days or 60 days after we shipped. And that was phenomenal for being able to, to bootstrap the company because these guys did the procurement, they did the assembly, the testing, you know, all that stuff for me because there's no way I could have possibly done that out of my apartment. And so it was really Winston Chen um, being visionary to, to offer me a line of credit to get it started. It was good for, for him because it was good for his business. As well, you know, of course, Electron, uh, you know, went on to be, um, you know, pretty, um, a pretty significant sized business. Mm -hmm. So, uh, did that use a a dedicated chip, or did you still have the discrete? No, I still have the the you know sort of the old design because we because we look with forty thousand dollars, you know, and I was paying a guy, um, a car. I got together with Carl Engelbrecht, who was a a designer uh, out of Rome and took him out of Rome and employed him and there was a guy named Hugh McPherson who was in charge of our uh, production and uh, and so we had a small staff of people and uh, I had forty thousand dollars in savings and of course you know today that that doesn't go very far but uh, you know back then it it uh, it lasted us especially because uh, we had Selectron uh, doing the uh, the procurement and the the, the building of the uh, of the mice for us. So it was microprocessor plus. Uh, yeah, it was a microprocessor an design of, of plus plus an array plus two two arrays, mm -hmm. two quadrature arrays. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess that's uh, we've covered the uh, mouse. Um, Although, what about the? I think you had wanted to ask: Was there any other Oh, no, did you ask them whether there was a chip design based? Yes. Yeah, I mean, later, later in life in mouse systems, uh, so, you know, we started a company, Mouse Systems, to, so I quit my job at Rome Corporation and started a company, Mouse Systems, to go and produce this. 
Um, and this is, you know, 1982 time frame. And uh, uh, so I used my savings to hire people. Uh, we eventually got capital uh, into the company from outside investors and, um, you know, brought in prof professional management and, and so forth and grew the company. And uh, there was a guy named Carl Goy who was, um, uh, uh, he used to work at uh, like Heathkit. And uh, uh, so he joined and he hired some people uh, and they, you know, sort of up the level of design uh, so that we had a comparable uh, uh, chip mm -hmm. uh, technology to what, what HP uh, had. Did mouse systems only build optical mice? Always? Yeah, yeah, I was focused just purely on, on mice. Okay. Do one thing, do it really well. You said you quit your job at Roll? Yeah. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about how you got from MIT to OutTio. Uh, from MIT to where? To OutTio. Oh. You started working at Roll. Yeah. Um, you do the job interviews in MIT, right? And I liked, uh, I interviewed with Jeff Rulofsson, uh, formerly of Xerox Park, and he had joined Rome to do sort of Office of the Future stuff, so I joined his group. Oh, neat. So the cat and the cat came later, but you were. The mouse came. Uh, in those ideas. Yeah, I mean, basically, I had the mouse idea. I went and got a full time job. I licensed the mouse idea to Summa Graphics. They ended up paying me minimum royalties and doing nothing with the technology because it was competitive with digitizers. And so I said, screw that, and competed with them. They sued me. Um, they lost, they tried a preliminary injunction. They lost the preliminary injunction because you need to prove preponderance of the evidence and balance of hardships. They couldn't meet the balance of hardships test because I'm a little guy who'd be put out of business and they're this big corporation that wouldn't be affected. So they lost the um, uh, their um, uh, the um, uh, their order to uh, um, you know to try to stop me, mm -hmm. and uh, and so uh, we ended up negotiating an agreement where I, I was able to uh, to produce the mice. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, in, in 1985. Yeah, they basically tried to get an injunction, but to get an injunction, yeah. you need to have, meet the two tests. They only met one of the tests. If they had a smart lawyer, they would have realized that they didn't meet both tests. <laughs> they always said, you know, my money and, and their money on that one. Okay, so uh, okay. Uh, I guess then, uh, since since Mouse Systems, you founded uh, like six more companies or. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, can I ask you, how did you move from one to the next? Yeah, Was it's just it based, like uh, based on ideas and interests and, you know, you run across a problem and you say, I, oh, gee, I think I know how to solve this one. And, you know, so once you've solved one, then you say, okay, well, you know, that was fun. And, you know, the fun part is in solving the problem and bringing the solution to market. And then after that, it's like, you know, turning the crank and ramping up sales and so forth. And so I enjoy the problem solving. I enjoy, you know, looking at the world and looking at problems. And, um, and so each one of the companies was all started on a particular problem. So I started an anti-spam company um, because I was getting a lot of spam. Um, uh, the, I'd say FrameMaker was a little bit different. Um, I wasn't struggling to produce documents, but I heard about this guy, Charles, Charles Corfield who had written this program on the Sun Workstation and was intrigued by that and thought it would be an interesting business opportunity to bring it to market because there was a company called Interleaf and this, the software was super expensive and, and not that easy to use. And so um, I partnered with uh, uh, Charles Corfield and David Murray and uh, brought along Vicki Blakesley from Mouse Systems and the four of us uh, started um, uh, Frame Technology, which um, uh, was, um, much later, uh, it went public, and then it was acquired by Adobe Systems for half a billion dollars. There was a lot in between then, of course, but uh, but yeah. So, uh, in in most all the cases, it's running into a problem that you have yourself. Like I hate usernames and passwords, so I started this company called One ID to to create a secure. Um, uh, authentication and authorization system. And we succeeded in creating that technology, but we couldn't get anyone to adopt it. 
um, because of the approach that we took. And, and so, uh, it, and it, it was frustrating. I mean, when we went to the government and said, hey, look, you know, you guys ought to sponsor this and give it away free because if we could go and um, give everybody really strong authentication technology that, that was the same, that everybody had to just create their identity once and create the private keys once, and that could be leveraged over everything because the government would sponsor it, that would, that would change everything. That would make it really easy for people to authenticate and would make computers super secure and it would end data breaches because you could have the data in, um, encrypted with private keys that are only on, on your device so the, it would only be decrypted at the time that you needed to access the data which the, um, the third party could get from you and so they could decrypt the, your data at the time and then, then it would lose the decryption key. You know, so it would solve a lot of problems. So I went to the government and it was just, oh, you can't talk to us, talk to them. Uh, and then you talk to them, talk to them, talk to them. And, and then I finally got to what I thought was the right guy and um, tried to talk to him. But he, um, I'd call him 12 times, would get not, uh, he, he would refuse to answer. I actually um, went face to face with him once and it was like, then nothing happens. And you know, so you finally get, get directed to the guy who has the budget, and then, like zero. I mean, there's like no, there was no feedback at all for. Um, uh, here, this is why this is a stupid idea, right? And and I published it I, uh, on on Medium. You know, I said, you know, hey, here's how you can solve the, um, uh, the the problem with uh, with computer break-ins because we're still using this old-fashioned uh, shared secret technology of usernames and passwords. And, uh, and we have to move beyond that if we're really going to go and, and, and have any chance at all in uh, uh, making our system secure and still easy to use. And um, there were like 2,000 people who read it. Nobody had anything like, they, they just said, oh, the government would never do it. That was the problem with my ideas, that it was too good of an idea that the government would never do it. And, you know, they were right. The government would never do it. And so we ended up uh, selling the company off to another company. Um, and, and now it's being used for IOT, IOT right? So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's like, it, that was the biggest frustration, I think, of my career, was to solve the identity problem. I had a system that nobody could break into. And, and yet it was super, super simple for, for anyone to use. Couldn't get any adoption. Google said, not invented here, we're going with FIDO. Said FIDO is unmanageable. It's just repeating, you're just, you know, sort of moving up a level and it's gonna create a management nightmare. So nobody's using FIDO today um, that I've seen. Um, and uh, Yahoo said we were too small and PayPal said, no, you're too secure. And, uh, you know, it was like uh, Twitter said, uh, we're experts, we know how to solve this problem. You know, we don't need you. Uh, Evernote uh, said, hey, I'm, mm, go away, we're, we're going to fix our problems. So every time it got breached, you know, it was like you couldn't be an ambulance chaser, they wouldn't talk to you. And, uh, and then the, 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 the guys that do the, um, uh, uh, like, uh, and when you get broken in, you call, um, I forget the name of the, the company. Um, oh, and, yeah. Huh? LifeLock or something? Not LifeLock, no. no these, uh, the professionals, uh, uh, the guy named it the company after himself, and then they, uh, they merged with uh, Fi uh, 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 was it Fire, uh, FireEye. Um, FireEye bought them. Um, anyway, they were, they were like, uh, we don't even want to learn about your, your system. We don't even want to hear about it. I guess because if they heard about it and they promoted it to their customers, then, then their business would go down because there'd be fewer break-ins. So it was, re it was absolutely amazing to me. Um, and then the banks wouldn't want to do it because it was like, well, so who else uses this? And we're a bank, we don't do, you know. And so everybody's like sticking with really old-fashioned technology uh, to solve a high-tech problem. So, with, uh, so I started this company, Token, which is doing open APIs for banks. And so I kind of snuck in secure identity technology as part of that. And that, that works great, right? They, they don't even know they're getting secure identity as, as part of it. They're, we're like saying, hey, open APIs, this is really good. These are really powerful APIs. You can charge for your API calls. Under, under the covers, totally secure identity system. It's great. It's a way to do it. And then you know, if at first you don't it. succeed, try, try again. So that's being adopted now? Yeah. Yeah, big time.
Yeah, the and in fact, there's a regulation in the, the EU called PSD2 that requires banks to adopt uh, open APIs. And so, mm -hmm. hey, you know, I can leverage all the strong technology stuff that, that I developed at, uh, at OneID and use uh, similar concepts um, to provide secure uh, identity without any uh, user friction, very minimal user friction. Um, given that you've done so many things, I think uh, if you're willing, we should probably do a second session. Can we go back to the chronology and sort of, you know, as now systems segues into frame? Um, and just pick up there, and then we'll stop whenever you need to stop. Does okay. Does that sound good? Sure. Um, so, um, so, so I was doing... With mouse systems, I mean, you were aware of Bogitech at some point. Oh, early sure. On or later? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, very early on. When we first went into Sun, Logitech was, was trying to sell its... You know, they had a hemispherical mouse with three buttons in the front, so it was a, like a red half, half, um, half sphere. And there were three black buttons uh, that you would press, and so you put your hand around it, and, and they have a ball in the center, and so forth. And so they they had always been around, and, and you know we had always been you know friendly with those guys. I mean, you know, I had a lot of respect for uh, uh, for their accomplishments. I mean, they they were really uh, they were they were, they had a very good product. They did a great job. They were, they were mechanical in those days. So they were they were mechanical. I was optical. You know, I kind of won in that. Um, you know, they eventually now are now producing just all all uh, uh, optical mice. You know, in that sense. But they um, we got acquired uh, by a, a Korean company, KYE, and um, uh, and that uh, the company then tanked after that. So so a lot. You know, it's great that Logitech is around. That you know, and they, they they build high quality optical mice. I mean, today I use a Logitech Logitech mice. So, and I also use a lot kit, Logitech camera, and also their little, you know, presentation thing and so forth. So I'm a big user of the uh, Logitech uh, product. So no hard feelings at all. <laughs> and you said you got acquired. What year was that? Uh, Mouse Systems got acquired maybe uh, 10 years after we started the company. It's company was started in 82. Oh, okay, 82. you had already left by then, so. Um, yeah, you... I, I left. I left because I, I saw this shiny new object with, with Charles Corfield and, and Frame and decided to you know, do something different because I'd been doing optical mice for a while. And what was your role at Mouse Systems? You were, you I, I, I was the founder, CEO, chief architect, you know. I d designed and built yeah. it, run the company, hired the people. Yeah, that was my business and how experience. How many employees did you have? Oh, geez, uh, maybe about uh, 30, 30 people. By the time you left? Yeah. Might, might have been less. So then talk about the genesis of the idea for Frame. So well, Frame was, was uh, uh, there was a guy, uh, John Gage, who worked at Sun Microsystems. John, John Gage is kind of like their chief scientist, and he'd roam around um, uh, kind of aimlessly and, you know, discovering interesting things. And John Gage ran across this guy named Charles Corfield. Corefield had contacted some microsystems because he was interested in um, computers and doing something with uh, Sun, Sun workstations. And he, he talked Sun out of getting a loaner Sun workstation to develop software. And Sun, of course, wanted to give out workstations to people to creating software so there'd be more Sun workstations sold. <coughs> so they had a loaner program. Charles uh, um, got a, um, a loaner workstation and they, he started writing this, this um, um, this desktop publishing program, and um, I think w we were the ones who named it uh, FrameMaker um, because it had a concept called frames in it. And uh, so his notion was, oh, you could have a text box and you can have this text linking from this um, box to another box and so forth. And so that ended up um, uh, being a pretty good idea. And we ended up starting a company uh, out of it. We got funding from Toshiba, who bought source code rights, and DEC, who bought source code rights. And um, so we funded it uh, partially through, uh, uh, through selling source code. And, um, and, uh, and so we succeeded, because we built up a, a great team of people. Uh, you know, David Fuchs uh, was on the team. Um, 
uh, Ken, uh, uh, blanking on his last name, um, uh, was, uh, was a big contributor. David Murray, uh, Charles Corfield uh, uh, worked on it. Ken, Ken Keller. Was your target? Ken Keller. And who was your target audience again? Uh, target audience were people in tech pubs. We definitely focused on the tech pubs marketplace. Which is what it yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we and, used you to know, so HP. they, you know, when people came to us, they said, do you do tables? We said, tables, what are tables? You know, it was funny. We were learning on the job, right? Uh, and so were you plugged into the HTML community at that time? Uh, no, that wasn't big at the, the beginning. Uh, it was more PostScript, right? You know, so um, we were trying to demo this thing. You know, and, 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 and Charles wrote this great program, and the one thing it didn't do was print. And we said, you know, printing is actually pretty important for a documentation, you know, uh, thing. And so he said, yeah, you're right. And so he got a copy of the PostScript manual and read it, and then he figured out how to make frame maker print and so that was like an amazing experience we had a we rented a house in uh, like on uh, um, in morgan hill uh, because david murray lived in morgan hill so charles wanted to live n near david so we rented a house we were doing all the development of a of, of frame out of a house a rented house uh, in uh, in morgan hill that, that charles rented and then you know david dropped in on because he was he he lived close by um, and so the two of them uh, were, the, um, were the primary authors, and David w was amazing, and Charles is an amazingly smart guy. Yeah, we used it at HP it really to write papers. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry? Oh, I, I was going to say, we used it at HP to write papers for publication. Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, David was just a real stickler for, for great user interface design and great documentation. It was amazing the quality of the, the work coming out of these oh, guys. Yeah, I, no, I used it and it was a great program. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we spent a lot of time, you know, user testing and David was just an awesome UI designer. I mean, he, he was, you know, it's like pixel, you know, move this thing here and he could, re, he had great sense of design. Never run into anyone. Yeah, I mean, it, there was a sense that it, it was put together as one piece, not sort of an aggregation. That's right, because there were only two guys that really were the, the, the primary architects, and then David Fuchs and Ken Keller were, were added uh, to it later. And so we had a very small core team of guys, uh, that guys who were really brilliant, off the charts brilliant um, designing that. That's why you had, that's why it was easy to use and was consistent, because it was designed by a very small team. And then we brought in other people, you know, later on as we, as we expanded uh, the team and grew the team. Um, uh, so people like Gus Fernandez on the um, uh, on the Mac product, and this guy named Kevin Lynch uh, was managing the um, the Mac product for us. And of course, Kevin is now uh, sort of uh, I, I guess he's like the CTO for Apple. So so Kevin kind of got his start. And you know when Kevin was working for us, people said, oh you know this guy is gonna you know he's gonna he's gonna do great things later on in life. You know so so we had a had a prediction there. Um, and you, you know, said the original idea was coming more out of the payoff program. I'm sorry, more out of what? More out of page design was the original goal, more than structured documents. Or uh, you know, we realized we, we were doing long structured documents because we realized that a page by page thing wouldn't cut it. And so, as we were designing FrameMaker, it was designed for large documents. And so Apple Tech Pubs, um, you know, adopted it and so forth because it was really, really strong. But then we added SGML capability uh, later. When was that? Um, pretty late. I think it was um, like FrameMaker 5 or FrameMaker 6. Because it was a very, very whole kind of niche was to be well-structured documents. That's right. It sounds like that. Yep. Yeah, so the, the, the SGML thing was, was kind of an afterthought. We had this maker interchange format called MIF uh, that was used to get, so we could go in and out and you can, so you could do things and process in other programs and then bring it, dump it back into FrameMaker and not lose anything. And that was nice because it was a sort of a tag language very much SGML-like. 
Um, and that was our, you know, sort of extensibility, uh, our open strategy, because the maker file format was proprietary and, you know, we, we would change it over time, but the MIF was designed to be uh, compatible over all uh, generations. Uh, you know, so that if you wrote MIF 1.0, it would be readable even though you were in MIF 3.0. I mean, I used it on the Mac, but what was the, the bulk of your market? Was which platform? Oh, uh, uh, primarily on the, the PC. Uh, let's see. Well, I mean, the Unix workstations, I think, was really was the big thing. And then we ported it to, to Mac and the PC. But the Unix uh, drove, that was our initial focus. Because these workstations were big, they had big screens and so forth. And, you know, you were able to do... Uh, Big documents and um, and also we could charge a lot. We charged twenty five hundred dollars for the, uh, you know I remember we had twenty five hundred dollars for prototype FrameMaker point six, so it's pretty cool that you could sell a prototype software for uh, uh, for twenty five hundred bucks, and we had a package on a on a tape, right? So that you you take the tape and you stick it into the Sun Microsystems computer and that's how we sold FrameMaker. So the original thing was a. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd make these um, these tapes and we'd label them Frame Maker Point Six, and uh, yeah, it was uh, those were the days. <laughs> and can you talk a little bit about Frame as a company? Who, who were the initial investors? What kind of board did you have? What was your role? Um, yeah, the initial investors, like I remember, Hamrick and Quist and Menlo Ventures uh, were investors in in Frame technology. So. Uh, Christina Morgan from Hamburg and Quist um, was there uh, as an investor. Dubois Montgomery from uh, Menlo Ventures, um, and uh, so I was CEO for a while. We brought in uh, la later on as the com company grew bigger. We brought in you know professional management. Some of these guys flamed out pretty quickly. Uh, there was a guy named Bruce uh, something or other who ran the company briefly, and then uh, Paul Robichaud uh, ran it, and, uh, and then it was acquired by Adobe. I think there was another guy after Paul Robichaud um, before it was uh, acquired by Adobe. And what kind of board did you have? Um, uh, for, for Frame, um, do not remember. No. But it was a public company. No. So I'm sure that would be in the record somewhere. <laughs> Sure. No, no, I was just wondering if they, it sounds like they were not playing a big day-to-day -day role. Um, yeah, no, I mean, we let the management team. Not an team, activist. Yeah, let, yeah, let the management team run the company. Yeah. And, uh, and there was this, this crazy guy, uh, our VP of sales, Steve Klan, he used to be, he worked in Interleaf, and he was always, uh, and he brought in this guy named Max Hoffman, who was this, this killer application engineer. And, and is probably, I think he's still at Adobe to this day. Uh, but if you want to know history of FrameMaker, talk to Max Hoffman. He's like an encyclopedic knowledge of everything that happened. So what led you to your next um, beginning of the... Yeah, I kind of got burned out on uh, uh, you know, doing Frame and then uh, uh, someone introduced me to this thing called Computer Library. And I looked at that and I said, man, this is great. You know, wouldn't it be great if you had a search engine that uh, would, uh, would search over um, other, uh, all these publications for a lot cheaper than what dialogue charges? Because dialogue charges were like, you know, $10 a search. Nobody could afford that. I thought if you brought the cost down to 10 cents, that this would be killer. And you could search through all these computer magazines and other things. And so the original idea behind InfoSeq was... Uh, let's make search lower cost. It wasn't search the internet. And then um, one of the guys said, hey, uh, you know, why don't we offer free internet search? And I said, no, nah, we can't offer free search because then we're not going to make any money. So it'll be the first 10 hits are free, and then if you wanted more than, than the first 10, then you'd have to, to su subscribe for like $10 a month or $0.10 cents a query or or whatever. So that was the initial model was to, to charge because, you know, how else were you going to go and charge for search? And so it wasn't until later 
that um, one of the guys suggested, oh, you know, you should, we should sell advertising and give away the search. And we said, hmm, that's an innovative model. Let, you know, let's give that a try. And so that, uh, that ended up being, you know, so we ended up, uh, you know, creating the banner ad um, uh, because of that. And we hired a, a guy who, you know, we brought in to do the ad sales who came up with, you know, uh, the, this concept of, of the, the banner ad. So we created the original, this would be the standard size format for banner ads. And so that's how we would monetize the, uh, uh, the free search because otherwise we wouldn't be making any money. And, uh, and that worked. Uh, yeah, it worked pretty well, actually. <laughs> and what year do the banner ad, what year do you uh, That was probably, yeah, um, you know, early 90s, I think. You know, my, uh, I may be getting my years wrong, but I think it's like 1992, 1993, somewhere around there. I'm sure there are history but books already... on the. Yeah, we were, we were like the pioneers of the, of the banner ads. And then we would tie it to keywords, and then we would sell keywords, and that's how we would monetize. Gee, oh. sound familiar, <laughs> huh? Yeah. So, so all those concepts were, you know, something that that, that uh, I think we pioneered. And, and there are Lycos and some other search engines, and I'm not sure how they, they monetized it, but they probably, you know, copied the same same sorts of ideas. Did you patent this, like the banner ad? And uh, I don't think I don't think so. Yeah, we were too, you know, like focused on how do we make money at the time to, to think of that. You know, and that probably wouldn't have been good for anybody if we patented that. GNN actually came out with a, GNN had banner ads on three. And so this was a bit of jostling as to which was the first. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, you know, and I'm not trying to come, hey, I invented the banner ad, you know, whatever. I, I just know that, you know, we went to this, paid model to, to giving it away free and charging for ads. Mm -hmm. and, th and that worked better. And, and you said it didn't start out with internet search, so you were going to have your own database to search? Or? Yeah, we started out by, we, we were trying to go to computer library and license their database and, and um, uh, IAC to license their database. And you know that took a while to license and come up with the terms. And we'd have to charge people a monthly fee and you know all this stuff. And so um, it just worked out better. You know, trying to be like another dialogue. Yeah, cheaper dialogue, right? Dialogue for the masses. Or access to access. Yeah, essentially what the internet is today. You know, you know, we we were trying to do that, but the guys wouldn't, you know, budge. You know, it'd be be like. You know, before iTunes, right, you know, you'd be, the record companies wouldn't release their stuff, right, so you couldn't get to it. You know, and now, of course, there's Spotify and um, other services like that um, where it's much, much more affordable, right? You pay one price and you get access to anything. That's kind of what we wanted. That was our sort of model for information. But, of course, now everybody is like, yeah, search the Internet and all this stuff is, you know, available for free. Some of this is behind firewalls, but, yeah. But so long were you going as a dialogue type company for a while? You already no, had a fairly short amount of time. Um, and, uh, and then we, we uh, realized that web search was where we were getting the most traffic. Didn't, didn't take long. We were, you know, we, we'd watch what people were doing. Were yeah. you looking to like Waze or RG, things like that as a model? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we knew about uh, uh, Waze and what they were doing, um, but uh, it, it really didn't um, uh, cause us to take any detours. And your secret sauce was really web search, right? Yeah. Internet. Yeah, we licensed uh, initial search technology from University, uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst. There was a guy named Bruce Croft. And he invented this um, really cool uh, 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 search system called Inquiry. And uh, so we used a lot of techniques from that. So Didn't quite get the page rank stuff that Google did, mm -hmm. right? You know, so that was really brilliant uh, insight that Larry Page had. And who were the main other people early on? Um, and InfoSeq, uh, Andy Bensky. Um, this guy named Todd, uh, I think Todd Jones, uh, Zara uh, Haimo, um, 
Uh, let's see. Um, William Chang, um, Ray Sorsa, Ray went to LoudCloud uh, later. Um, Mike, um, uh, 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 there's a Mike Schwartz, uh, but there is another, uh, there are other, um, uh, yeah, so if you, if you show me the names, I'd remember them, but yeah, so it was a while ago. And, and you were the founder and CEO? Yeah. Yep. And so you became, once it went to Web Search, then you set up a former company. Tell me about the progression step. Um, I mean, I started the company as a search engine company, and uh, we just grew and grew and grew after that. You know, we, we became the official button on, on Netscape and, and so forth. We got in venture capital money, hired a professional CEO. He didn't work out. Um, we hired another guy from CNN, um, uh, and, uh, and that worked out really well. Um, and uh, who were the main investors then? I mean, this is the beginning. Yeah, uh, Menlo Ventures uh, was in it. Uh, Battery Ventures was in it. Um, uh, Yellow Pages, I think, uh, invested. There's M Matt Stover was on our board from Yellow Pages, or White Pages, or whatever, or something Pages. And that, this is the era when Yahoo was doing director of search, so we had a team at CERN. I mean, how yeah. do you see keyword yeah. search? Well, we, you know, Yahoo, Yahoo did, um, you know, Yahoo was doing a directory and then added search, and we were a search engine who added directory. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, you did add a directory. Yeah, we did add a directory later on, but it was kind of like too little too late. And, of course, there was Excite at home. There was Excite, and then Excite became Excite at home, and, and so forth. So there are other people in that space. But directories yeah, so have kind of gone away. The main competitor um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know, it was a very, there was a series of competitors. You know, Excited Home was pretty aggressive. Uh, Lycos was aggressive. Then came Alta Vista, and they then became the new kid on the block. And then uh, Google, um, you know, came on after that. As cheap. Yeah, ask Jeeves. They were kind of a uh, niche player. And so Alta Vista, I mean, by 96 or so, Alta Vista was getting very big. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, DEC put a lot of their, uh, their guys on it and so forth. And that was a, it was like a sales pitch to here's why you should buy these, these big DEC machines because, look, it powers Alta Vista and, you know, su super capable. So they were kind of doing it to, to really promote deck hardware, I think, rather than tr deck trying to be in the search business. And um, who were the main people behind like, doing the crawl for InfoSeq? Uh, for InfoSeq, I wrote the original crawl um, uh, software in Python uh, and did it multi-threaded, and then um, you know, other people uh, improved the, uh, the work since then. How different was it from what had been done before in terms of crawling? Oh, you know, crawling is, is, is pretty um, uh, standard stuff. I mean, you, you started a root and, and you just let it loose and, you know, you can start at multiple routes and, and then you figure out whether you want to go, you know, normally you do kind of breadth first rather than, than depth and so you just go. And we tried to limit our stuff to popular pages, like the 10 million most popular pages, so you wouldn't get a lot of crap. If you typed in a word, you weren't going to get a lot of, of craps. So, and we would rate the pages based on relevance to your query. And so Google's invention about you know, rating it based on sort of importance and how many links are pointing to it. Um, we incorporated that sort of thing later, but Google, um, you know, that was a great insight. 
that was, you know, that was just a, you know, multi-billion dollar idea to do that. It's amazing how powerful that idea was. And that gave them better results than we had. We, we gave you relevant pages, but they gave you pages that you were more likely to, were thinking about when you typed in that search term.